Thank you. What's your thing? We have a nice sort. Mayor Mitchell, not give a lot to say. Los Angeles, California, Hamasara, Los Angeles, Pajni, Padmutian, the Norena, Sebu Aslanian, or Richard Popanusiani, Derne. I serve a bit of a Sahosin, Uri Perberiani, Amasin. Professor Perberian, Padmutian, Ustiche, not Ankleno Pidila Sahosin, Ankleno was in Astolora. Professor Uri Perberian is a professor of Middle Eastern history of Cal at California State University, Long Beach where she also serves as the director of the Middle Eastern Studies program. She's the author of a number of articles and books. One of the books is Armenians and the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911. Yev, the love of freedom has no fatherland. She is currently working on a book project connecting the early 20th century revolutions in the Russian, Ottoman, and Iranian Revolutions. It's a pleasure to be here, but before I begin, can you hear me well? Just a, a little louder? How's that? Okay. If at any point I go down, just go like this. <laughs> I won't be offended. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, thank you especially to ADPA for inviting me, in particular Dr. Hago Panosian, uh, with whom I've been in uh, contact regarding uh, scheduling uh, this talk. So my talk today grows out of uh, my current book project, which is the one that uh, was mentioned in the introduction, which looks at three revolutions, the Russian, the Ottoman, and the Iranian, occurring almost simultaneously in the early 20th century and in regions bordering each other. All three were part of a larger global wave of revolutions with very similar demands, that is, the establishment of representative government through parliament and constitution, which revolutionaries thought to be the remedy for all of their ills. I look at how these revolutions were connected to each other by focusing on the circulation of Armenian revolutionaries and intellectuals who took part in one way or another in all three revolutions. And I also look not only at the revolutionaries themselves, but also their ideas. This is how I will pursue, uh, proceed. I'll ask a few questions, and I will try to answer them as I go along, and, and providing a basic uh, global context to the revolutions, and give you a glimpse of how the revolutions are connected through this circulation I just mentioned. So let's begin. In 1907, Skilled bondmaker and revolutionary Stepan Zoryan, known to his comrades simply as Rosto, sat with Iranian constitutionalist, le constitutionalist leaders and agreed to a deal. He consented to place the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the Tashnaktushun, the leading Armenian party at the turn of the 20th century, at the service of the Iranian Constitutional Revolution, Revolution which had begun in December 1905. Months later, he and others took arms against royalist forces, trying to halt the progress of the Constitutional Revolution. Only two years earlier, before the meeting with the Iranians, in 1905, Rostom had been far from the Iranian scene, stirring things up in the Caucasus during the Russian Revolution of 1905, convincing his party comrades there to include the Caucasus in their revolutionary struggle. Fast forward three years to 1908, and Rostov turns up in yet another part of the region, in the Ottoman, and Ottoman Empire, where he took part in important discussions with Ottoman revolutionaries involved in the reinstatement of the Constitution and the revolution of that year. His geographic mobility, his sudden appearance at pivotal moments in three different states' revolutionary struggles, and his remarkable ease when operating in varied and dramatically different milieus are nothing short of striking. Yet Rostov was only one of many Armenians and other Caucasians 
who made their way through the early 20th century revolutions in the Ottoman, Russian, and Iranian states. The involvement of these men points to a fascinating but heretofore unexamined and important feature of, the, of these modern revolutions. That is, the critical circulation of not just ideas, arms, material, literature, but also revolutionaries. And you'll see here, just to point out two images, I have these here on purpose, because what I'm talking about are revolutionaries and intellectuals. And in the case of Rostom, he is both. On your right side, he looks more like, you know, he's cleaned up, he looks like your professional intellectual, and on your left side, he looks like the fierce revolutionary that he was. And so you often found the revolutionary and intellectual combined in one person. Not always, though. And we'll see pictures of people who <coughs> combined. So, moving on. Now, the Caucasus was vital for both the Ottoman uh, and, the, uh, and the Iranian revolutions, and of course for the Russian revolution as well. It served basically as a hotbed of radical ideas, a multi-ethnic zone of coexistence, but also of conflict, especially in major urban centers like Tiflis and Baku, and a hub of worker strikes and protests. Due to many interior and exterior political, economic, social developments and factors, revolutionary and intellectual Armenian elites took part in the Russian Revolution, 1905, in the Ottoman of 1908, and were instrumental in the Iranian Revolution that spanned from 1905 to 1911. But these revolutions only make sense when we consider them in their larger context. What is this context? Now, let's begin with where the Armenians are. Some of you are obviously here. But historically speaking, where were the Armenians? That was just a little joke. It <laughs> fell flat. <laughs> um, at the turn of the 20th century, Armenians constituted a minority in three states, Ottoman, Russian, and Iranian. The largest communities of Armenians lived in the Ottoman Empire in eastern Anatolia. A smaller Armenian community existed in the Arax Valley and Ararat Plain, as well as the southern Caucasus, the Armenian community of Iran, unlike the Armenians in the Ottoman and Russian empires, constituted a tiny minority of the Iranian population. All three communities went through a period of increased education and politicization in the latter half of the, 20, of the 19th century. However, while the journalistic and literary renaissance and the revolutionary movement in the late 19th century had strong resonance among Ottoman Armenian elites, they reached their peak and were more fully developed by Caucasian Armenian intellectuals and revolutionaries at the turn of the 20th century. So here you have, I think you can see there, so there's the, obviously the Ottoman Empire, the Armenian population would be in Eastern Anatolia, and then of course in the Southern Caucasus in the, uh, and as well as the Arax Valley, Arax Plain, and a much smaller community uh, right here in Iran, uh, focused mostly in the northern uh, Iranian province of uh, Azerbaijan. So, as I mentioned earlier, these revolutions only make sense if we look at them in their global context. You can't look at them in a vacuum because it just doesn't uh, add up. So what is this larger context that, we're ta that I keep mentioning? The movement and participation of Armenians, among others, in these revolutions tells us a great deal about their particularities, but also signals the global transformations that had begun to take shape in the last half of the 19th century. Easier and faster transportation, mainly through newly built ra railways. Access to communication through the telegraph, for example. Think of the telegraph uh, basically as today's social networking, the, the, the Twitter and the Facebook that have been responsible for the uh, Arab uprisings. The telegraph served that kind of purpose in the early 20th century. News from different parts of the region through the movement of people and literature, especially in the form of periodicals, all helped produce dramatic changes, rising expectations, discontent, and experimentation with new ideas. Because of their participation in all three revolutions, their border crossings, as we saw in the regions that I pointed earlier, within the region and even beyond to Europe and elsewhere, 
Their adoption interpre and interpretation of and adaptation to such influential and global ideologies as socialism and constitutionalism. Armenian revolutionaries become ideal subjects for the retelling of the complex story of the revolutions, a story of linkages of local and regional actors with global ties to big idea ideas and big ideologies. So what were these revolutions about? The three revolutions under discussion were much like earlier revolutionary waves that had swept the Atlantic world and after the French Revolution of 1789, and then again in Europe in 1848, and part of a global wave of revolutions, including, which happened at the same time, including the Chinese, 1912, dates are very close, the Mexican, 1911, Portuguese, 1910, so all of these revolutions are happening at the same time in different parts of the world. The revolutions in the Russian, Ottoman, and Iranian states drew strength from each other's successes and attempted to learn from each other's failures. And you even find Chinese revolutionaries, Portuguese revolutionaries, talking about the revolutions taking place in the region that we're discussing today. So they're all tied uh, in, in many different ways. The Russian Revolution of 1905 is the first of the three to occur. It was characterized by a series of protests, worker strikes, and mutinies in parts of the Russian Empire, including the Caucasus. It marked the culmination of decades of both liberal and radical, and of course everything in between, opposition to the Tsar's unchecked authority and attempts to limit the autocracy's powers through constitutional limitations. The promise of reform, the concession to form a parliament, did little to meet the demands of constitutionalists who were disappointed by the limits placed on the electorate. The struggle continued between the oppositional forces and the Tsar and among constitutionalists themselves until 1907 when finally the autocracy restored its, restored its authority in direct violation of the constitution, which it had conceded in 1906. But despite its failure, Despite the failure of the Russian Revolution of 1905, the revolution left behind an enduring legacy of a process of political, economic, and social change. Moreover, the Russian Revolution had a tremendous intellectual, ideological, and political impact on the Ottoman and especially Iranian revolutions. The Ottoman Revolution of 1908. It involved a coalition of forces, including an exile community in Geneva and Paris, discontented civil servants, students, ethnic and religious minorities, including the Armenians, army officers, and was preceded by strikes and tax rebellions in Anatolia. Although they varied in background, outlook, and demands, oppositional groups all agreed on the restoration of the 1876 Ottoman Constitution and Parliament, both of which sought to limit the autocratic powers of the Sultan. In the face of coordinated military campaigns by the Second and Third Armies, demanding the restoration of the Constitution, Sultan Abdul Hamid acquiesced. Multi-ethnic and multi-religious celebrations in the streets greeted the news, followed by elections and assembly meetings. The attempted counter-coup in 1909 resulted in the victory of the Third Army and deposition, finally, of the Sultan, but laid bare the constitutional authorities' tenuousness. And we also know that the, the counter coup of 1909 also resulted in the Adama massacre uh, of Armenians. Much like the Russian and Ottoman cases, the Iranian Revolution, which began in December 1905 and ended in December 1911, sought parliamentary representation, constitutional government, limits on the authority of the Shah, and other reforms. So very similar to the others. In the Iranian case, however, and more like the Ottoman than the Russian, an increasingly threatening European imperialism also played a role in the unfolding of revolution and its consequences. Oppositional forces in the revolution ran the gamut from ulama, clerics, and bazaris, merchants, to secular progressives and socialists, and found strength in Russia's defeat in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. And of course, it found strength in the Russian Revolution itself. Although the revolutionary struggle continued for several years, its initial success came in July 1906, when Shah Mozaffar conceded to an assembly, a majlis, and constitution, 
and shortly after attempted two coups, uh, of which the one in June 1908 had a successful outcome. Popular troops, the Mojahedin, Bakhtiari tribal forces, and Armenian Fedais joined in battles against royalist forces and restored the constitution in July 1909. Financial, factional, and other problems plagued the constitutional government, but ultimately Russian interference, supported by the British, led to the dissolving of parliament and the end to the revolution in December 1911. All three revolutions under discussion, Russia, 1905, Ottoman, 1908, Iranian, 1905 to 1911, involved the participation of Armenian revolutionaries and intellectuals, who contributed in differing ways and degrees with varying rates of success to revolutionary preparation, process, and development. Whatever the parallels or dissimilarities among the revolutions, neither the revolution, neither the revolutions nor the participants were isolated from each other. In fact, they were inextricably connected. Activists of all three revolutions knew of and about each other and their actions. Therefore, it's essential that such contemporaneous, geographically close revolutions be considered in conjunction and with reference to the larger contemporary context and in connection to each other by exploring the circulation of Armenian revolutionaries and political activities in Russia, Iran, and the Ottoman Empire. So the project that I'm working on is informed by and aims to give back to world historical and connected histories approaches and scholarship through the telling of the revolutionary that drama that unfolded in the early 20th century in the Middle East and Caucasus, as imperial, as trans-imperial subjects of, as the Armenians, conceived, espoused, and spouted revolution in both words and deeds. So the study attempts to make a contribution on two different levels. First, it inserts Armenians into world history and world historical studies. Second, it invites world historical studies to rethink the place of less well-represented or little-studied peoples like the Armenians. In a sense, therefore, I'm trying to get Armenians out of the marginality they have at times inscribed for themselves and others have inscribed for them, to tell a more compelling and intriguing story that spans three empires, provides a way to foreground histories often hidden by national as well as nationalist approaches. So, now that we know what the revolutions were about, how did Armenians participate in all three revolutions? Armenians played an increasing, an interesting, and at times important role in the events leading to revolutions in all three empires, and in the course of the revolutions themselves. In 1904 and 1905, during the Russian Revolution, Armenians, who had been simultaneously inspired by Russian socialist and populist ideals and activism, and shocked, in a way, into nationalist revolutionary activity by the Russian seizure of Armenian church properties in 1903, took part in worker strikes in the multi-ethnic caucuses joining Georgian, Russian, and Muslim workers, and collaborated with Georgians and other Russian subjects, calling for the overthrow of the Tsar. Of course, this kind of cross-ethnic solidarity was shattered during the violent clashes between Caucasian Armenians and Muslims in 1905 and 1906. The confiscation of church properties and the conflict itself became an important stimulus for a re-evaluation of the major Armenian political party's policies, which basically began to equate a struggle against Ottoman oppressive, the Ottoman oppressive rule in Anatolia with Russian oppressive rule in the Caucasus. So they basically, where before, the Ottoman struggle was primary, the Russian struggle was almost non-existent, now the Russian struggle became secondary. It never quite made it to the top, but it was close enough. In the Ottoman Empire, the story was similar yet different, but certainly influenced by activities in the Caucasus and Iran. The alliance of some elements of the burgeoning Young Turk movement and the Armenian Revolutionary Federation led between 1905 and 1907 to uprisings and revolutionary activities in Eastern Anatolia, participation in the Congress of 1907 in Paris, which basically agreed to force the abdication of Sultan Abdul Hamid and put in place a constitutional and consultative system through any appropriate means, including armed and unarmed resistance, 
propaganda and so forth, and of course, tactical alliance, at least until 1911. The decision to seize military operations against the Ottoman government made it possible, in the case of the ARF, the Pashtun Institute, to collaborate with the Young Turks and for the Armenian revolutionaries of both the Minchangyan and Tashtan Tuchun parties to concentrate their efforts outside of the Ottoman Empire, specifically Iran. Which brings us to the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. The collaboration and contribution, both ideological and military, of Armenians to the Iranian Constitutional Revolution were certainly the most successful and most significant in scope of all three revolutions. Talks between Tashtag Armenian and Iranian constitutionalists that began in 1907, remember Rostam was there, led to collaboration in mid-1908. Hunchaks, as well as independent Caucasian, Armenian, and Iranian social de democrats also took an active and important role in the revolution, initiating, for example, the formation of a new and subsequently influential Iranian political party, the Democrat Party, in 1909. Armenian fighters, Hunchaks, but especially Tashnaks under the command of border crossers Yepem Khan, Keri, and Nigol Tuman, were helpful and at times critical in many military operations. Here you see several uh, images of Yepem Khan, who was instrumental in the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. At the bottom there, uh, there he is. He's uh, sitting next to a, the uh, leading Bakhtiari leader uh, with whose help he was able to uh, retake the, the government from the counter to the shop. And right here, you have on your right a picture of Kedi and of course, the old Tuman with his group uh, on the left. Oops, on the left. Uh, and here, uh, you know, he will on. So, <coughs> Who's circulating and where are they circulating? I mean, if we're going to talk about connecting these revolutions based on the fact that these people are circulating, then we need to talk about where they're going, who's going where, what's going on. The crisscrossing of intellectual and revolutionary uh, elites within the Caucasus, Anatolia, and Iran was not only prevalent in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but also at times astonishing in its frequency and the number of sites it affected. Tiflis, Baku, Istanbul, Tabriz, just to name a few. They're all over the place. Several individuals stand out, not only because of their travels, but also because of their activism in at least two, if not three, of the regions and or revolutions under the discussion. The trajectories of Yepem Khan, revolutionary leader and later Tehran chief of police, Rostom, with whom I began this talk, and many others, like Keri, Madiros Sharukjan and Tashnak Zagan Khecho, from activism and militancy in the Caucasus to the struggles in Iran and the Ottoman Empire are good examples of this multiplicity. And the names are up there. And, I'll, and you'll see the faces again. Others like Mejo, Aram Hagopian, and Sebu got their start in Ottoman Anatolia and in all cases ended up in the Iranian Constitution Revolution. And in the case of Hagopian and Sebu also became involved in the Caucasus in 1905. So here again, we have three revolutions. In addition to men, weapons and ammunitions also traveled within the same circles and through revolutionary networks. There's correspondence uh, in the uh, Tashan Shun archives about, uh, look, we need seven, uh, yeah, we need 70 rifles, we only have this much, we need so many bullets. The, 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 material is traveling, the arms, the guns, the bullets, is traveling as much as the literature and the people and the ideas. So Armenian political parties uh, began activities in the Caucasus, Eastern Anatolia, and soon after spread to Northern Iran in the late, 20, uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, many sources, some of whose authors were revolutionaries or political activists themselves, testify to the significance and number of Armenian teachers and activists who came down to Iran from Tiflis, Baku, and other cities and towns in the Caucasus in the late 19th century. The three major Armenian political parties, the Armenagan, followed by the Nchagyan, and the Tashnak Chichun, used Iran as a launching ground for operations into Ottoman Armenia, or Anatolia. There they secretly organized small military groups established party branches, and disseminated party ideology, all with the purpose of ameliorating the situation of Armenians. 
They also transported arms from regions in the Russian Empire through Iran and across the border to the Ottoman Empire, or from Iran to Baku, especially during the Russian Revolution and during the violent clashes between Caucasian Armenians and Muslims. Monasteries served, I'll, I'll come back to that. Monasteries served as an important refuge and center of contact and exchange near the Ottoman-Iranian border. Here's a great example of St. Thaddeus Monastery in the Azerbaijan province in northern Iran that basically served as a safe house uh, for revolutionaries uh, and their arms as they crossed uh, the border between uh, Iran and the, and the Ottoman Empire. And on the left, you see an image of an arms workshop in Tabriz, in Iran, uh, where revolutionaries are making arms. Uh, and we know, for example, that one of the founders of the Tashtar Christopher Mikhaelian, uh, was killed in the process of trying to make a bomb uh, for um, revolutionary uh, purposes. So uh, just to give you faces with the names, uh, I mentioned Asebu Mujo, Tashak Sagan Pecho, Keri, Yefem Khan, and of course, Mazum Pecho, not to be confused uh, with his brother, Jaja Khanpo. <laughs> Just make sure you're away. Okay. okay. So now, what is circulating? Uh, we, we see who's circulating. What's circulating? Equal, equally important as men and arms were ideas, uh, particularly socialism in its many variants, that filtered through the borders via revolutionaries, intellectuals, workers, and literature including revolutionary pamphlets, circulars, newspapers, these are party organs, and so forth. Socialism appealed to Armenian revolutionaries as it did to many European and Caucasian groups of that period. In the Caucasus, Armenians were affected by their contact with Russian intellectuals and exposure to Russian revolutionary populism and Marxist socialism. For many Armenian intellectuals, the absence of industrial capitalism and a vital urban proletariat precluded a socialist revolution and socialist economic structure. They instead envisioned a liberal political revolution <coughs> modeled after Western European revolutions. At the same time as Russian and Georgian socialist influence increased in the Caucasus, especially in the 1890s, Armenians faced growing Russian and Georgian anti-Armenian sentiment and prejudice, which may have forced them to reevaluate their place in Caucasian society and espouse a future socialist society which suggested, at the very least, harmonious coexistence. The appeal of socialism to Armenian nationalists may have been further reinforced by the decline of European interest in the Armenian question after the 1880s and the subsequent disenchantment, to some degree, with European moderate liberal nationalism and the realization for the need for a more radical socialist ideology. Moreover, the popularity of socialism was in large part due to the perceived political, cultural, and economic freedom that its Armenian adherents envisioned. To them, a socialist society promised deliverance from oppressive rule. Very simple. In, in order of importance, Ottoman oppressive rule, Russian oppressive rule, and Iranian. Between 1905 and 1907, both the Tashan Tichun and the Chagan parties reevaluated their policies and for the first time in their history included the Caucasus in their revolutionary struggle, opening the way for collaboration with Russian parties opposed to Tsarism. Moreover, the Tashan Tichun linked socialism to collaboration with progressive forces and opened the path to participation in the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. But it was Armenian social democrats, like Baram Pirosyan, Dikran de Havopian, and others, a few of whom were former Hunchaks, who became the most important agents of the circulation of socialist ideas into Iran and helped found the Democrat Party in 1909. Despite attempts to link socialism to the anti-Hamidian movement in the Ottoman Empire, Armenians, in particular the Tashnak Suchun, <coughs> failed, failed in making any inroads in attempts to insert socialist ideas into the Young Turk movement. Now, I'm talking about socialism, but I also keep talking about Armenian nationalists and socialism. And we often tend to think that these are two very different 
fruits, apples and oranges. They actually are not. It's a very important to remember that socialist and nationalist ideas were not necessarily irreconcilable at the turn of the 20th century. They often coexisted. At times, they struggled together. At times, they struggled against each other. But the national question was still, <coughs> after all, hotly debated by <coughs> European socialists themselves, not just Armenians, by European socialists themselves, with varying adherence to an array of socialisms, not just one kind of socialism, just as there's not one kind of nationalism, but many nationalisms. Scholars who have dealt with one degree or another with what we might call Armenian socialism have often dismissed or downplayed the self-proclaimed socialist ideology or actions of Armenian revolutionaries and intellectuals as merely a tool or a guise for their true nationalist intent. I believe this is a mistake. It assumes a single, unitary, and exclusive nationalism and socialism with little consideration for its local variants, its context, and furthermore reflects a rather narrow and often presentist point of view that finds it difficult to entertain anything other than a nationalist ideology for Armenians. So faced with the difficulty of promoting a socialist revolution in a developing society, Armenian activists and thinkers produced their own version of socialism that was a hybrid suited to conditions in three different states. It was socialism, you might say, with an Armenian face or in Armenian colors. Theirs was a national socialism with an internationalist tint. So I've been talking about connections as if, well, I've been talking about connections as if they were true, and they are true. But my point is that what we often do as historians or as scholars or as individuals is we often project our own views backward. Because I see them as connected, I must think that they see them as connected. And is that, in fact, the case? Did the people participating in these revolutions, did the intellectuals, did the revolutionaries themselves see the connections between the revolutions? Or is this something I'm making up as a scholar as I look at the sources? Lucky for us, they did see the revolutions connected themselves. That is what is particularly striking about the contemporary outlook of Armenian revolutionaries, is that they themselves saw the three revolutions connected. So we're not making it up here in the 21st century. They themselves saw it in the early 20th century. As all three, as all three <coughs> re regimes were placed on equal footing, Ottoman, Russian, Iran, so too were the struggles against them. Their own discourse on the revolutions as expressed in party organs, revised programs or actions demonstrate their own awareness of not only the parallel developments taking place, but also the closely and intimately entangled revolutions in terms of development, causes, activities, and most importantly, consequences. They spoke of a popular awakening. This is, these are their words, not mine. A popular awakening that would overtake the East. They made the connections themselves and took inspiration, courage, and example from the revolutions that promised to transform the region. Therefore, they perceived the revolutions taking place in three regions as part and parcel of a global struggle that required alliances beyond borders and beyond partisanship. That's why they're taking part in revolutions in three different empires. Before I say a few words in conclusion, I'd like to say something about the sources. Um, what is, what is all this based on? What are all these conclusions, analyses based on? Uh, basically, my study relies heavily on the almost untapped Armenian language, unpublished and published documents, correspondence, meeting and Congress minutes, debates, decisions, and so forth, of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, uh, one of the first and not the first, but one of the first and leading socialist organizations of the period in the region. It utilizes contemporary periodicals as well, including party organs in Europe, the Caucasus, Iran, and the Ottoman Empire, uh, and soon British Foreign Office documents. Uh, I have been, in a sense, very fortunate to have had access to the private archives of uh, Tashtak Chuchun, who took part and crossed 
the figurative and literal borders of the Russian, Ottoman, and Iranian borders and revolutionary movements. So, um, so those sources are very important. Now to conclude, and I thank you for your patience so far, the history of early 20th century revolutions in the Russian, Ottoman, and Iranian empires viewed through the lens of the circulation of Armenian revolutionaries and intellectuals serves as yet another example of the centuries of encounters and interactions in the region, whether through the contact of merchants, pilgrims, or activists. The historical developments of the late 19th and early 20th centuries highlight the interactive process of agents, the circulation of political and social culture and ideas, and the sharing of expertise. Therefore, it becomes especially important to explore the history of the region and its revolutionary struggles not, one, not as one that is autonomous, but one that is interactive. That is connected through the flow of individuals, their ideas, their experiences. In that sense, the fact that Armenian revolutionaries and intellectuals, as both local and global agents, were figuratively and at times really all over the place, involved themselves in uh, revolutionary activities, at times even led them, as in the Iranian case, and were influenced by and influenced political culture as well as social and political ideologies, points to the connectedness of these revolutions, as well as the need to study them through one another uh, in terms of relationships, interactions, and circulation. And that's quote, quote. In a world of increasing globalization, transnational movements, and communications, this study is particularly relevant today, especially in light of the much discussed role of social media in the Arab uprisings and more recently Turkey and now Brazil. The fervent idealism and practical considerations of our roving revolutionaries as they made their way, their ideological and physical journeys through the Russian, Ottoman, and Iranian revolutions will, I hope, provide insight into how the revolutions are more than just similar and at the very core connected. Thank you.